the wars that these European, these German tribes fought. We go back 1600, the 30 year war, 100 year war. Mm -hmm. The Napoleonic Wars mm -hmm. in 1800, mm -hmm. there was England, France, Russia, and Germany, all cousins fighting each other. That Napoleonic War, they blamed on Napoleon, it was a pan-European war, these Germans fighting among themselves. You go on to the Franco-Prussian War. So all of last century, from 1800 to 1900, was one series of a war in Europe, from one end of Europe to the other, they killing each other. They continued this intra-ethnic war as World War I. Again, the same group, England, France, Germany, Russia, and they added their cousins in Yugoslavia. That's a pan-African war. Pa excuse me, a pan-European, pan germanic war. They had a little break. They went at it again, World War II. <laughs> a pan-European war. Germans fighting Germans. It is, it is that wars that they had that made it possible for all the people to begin to get independent. Remember, England, Fra Spain, Portugal, England, France, and Germany, and US, they had colonies, right? Each of these countries can hold its colonies under its own structure. But because of the Napoleonic Wars, or those wars in 1800, followed by World War I and II, all of these European countries destroyed themselves to such an extent that none of these European countries could hold on to their colonial structure by themselves. So after World War II, they had to collectivize. They had to sit down together and say, look, we, we destroyed each other and weakened each other so much that we can't hold on to our colonial structure. We must collectivize our energy as white Germans to continue to control the world. In 1945, those European Germans, called Americans, English, and French primarily, later added on by the Germans, would sit down and say, look, we have to devise a military unit among us Germans to dominate these people of color. So they born NATO. North Atlantic Treaty Organization is an organization of Western European countries band together against the Africans, the Asians, and et cetera, because they no longer individually could hold their colonial base. They needed a political structure in which they would collectively try to control you. So they formulated the UN. Now they need an international loan shark money scheme to get you. IMF, World Bank. Yes, sir. Bretton Woods, 1945, America's now becoming a dominant country because the Africans are, are colonized, the Asians are colonized, and Europe is devastated. So the United States is calling the shots. So in 19, 40, 1944, United States Germans will call a conference called Bretton Woods in New Hampshire, and they will set up these three organizations. And what I want to do is to read from, for you briefly a article from assessment. Let's apologize for coming. I need here. This is from Al Gore, who is a, uh, a, they could, a European environmentalist. And listen to what they're talking about, the Marshall Plan. Immediately after World War II, this is Gore speaking, history, Europe was so completely devastated. I'm quoting from Al Gore's book on the Global Marshall Plan as they review the Marshall Plan. You know what the Marshall Plan is, right? when America will try to help its European cousins. Immediately after World War II, Europe was so completely devastated. Well, you know during World War II, they killed off about 75 million of their own people. They devastated the whole continent. That's not including the 25 million that they killed of themselves in World War I. So between World War I and World War II, they killed 100 million of themselves. Add on to that, another 20 million that they kill of each other in the wars in 1800. Mm -hmm. And it was so bad in Europe that around 1850, that's when you got your mass migration of white people out of Europe to come to the Caribbean, to Central and South America and America. That's where you get your mass migration. So when you look at 
the killing of 125 million of their own people within a 100-year period, and the mass migration, you wonder, you understand why Europe is in a negative birth rate. Okay. Immediately after World War II, Europe was so completely devastated that the resumption of normal economic activity was inconceivable. They couldn't feed themselves, house themselves, or fuel. Then in the early spring of 1947, the Soviet Union rejected, it rejected the U.S. proposal for aid in Germany. So America said, look, can you Russians, can we two cousins get together to help the big cousin? Russia said, no, I'm taking it all. For the recovery of German industry, convincing General George Marshall and President Truman, among others, that the Soviets hoped to capitalize on the prevailing economic distress. The Russians were going to take it all. So Russian Americans said, no, we're not going to allow that. Not only in Germany, but also in the rest of Europe. They're going to take it all. After much discussion among themselves and study, the U.S. launched the basis for the Marshall Plan, technically known as the European Recovery Program. Of course, you know where they got the resources to do it from. <laughs> the commonly held view of the Marshall Plan is that it was a bold strategy for helping the nations of Western Europe rebuild and grow strong enough to fend off the spread of capitalism. So they're rebuilding the Europeans. The strategic nature of the plan, which its emphasis on the structural causes of Europeans' inability to lift itself out of its economic, political, and social distress, it was over. The plan concentrated on fixing the bottlenecks, such as a damaged infrastructure, flooded coal mines, and senseless trade barriers. That was impending the potential growth for each nation's recovery. The European recovery program was sufficiently long term that it could serve as an overall effect to produce fundamental structural reorientation, not just offer more emergency relief. It was a consciously, conscientiously designed to change the dynamics of the system to which it extended aid, thus facilitating the emergence of a healthy economy and pattern. That's what the white German American said. We got to get our people up. Now, this same continent you call Europe, if you look at the scheme, is now one of the trilateral parts. How could a continent that was destroyed to the point that it couldn't feed itself now become part of the world economic scheme where they are holding debt over my head, your head, and the rest of the world? What happened? So when we look at the trilateral, it only represents who? Those Western European countries, the former colonial powers, they added Japan on at the end, the United States, joined together using the NATO, the UN, and IMF and World Bank. They established the GATT, the, the uh, Agreement of Tariff, General Agreement of Tariff and Trade on how the world economy is going to run in 1945, made up by white people. You had nothing to do with it, but you got to follow the rules because who got more guns? They got more guns than you. But because of this fact of World War II primarily, then you, Africans and Asians, began to get a little bit of independence. And that started the movement of independence to African Asian people. And then you, you know about the different wars and struggles that brought us to the point. So now 1945, these Europeans are band together. They got, a, they got weapons to get atomic weapons. These European countries control 85, 90, 95% of all the world's resources. So if you wanted to develop as an African country, so if you look down on number four, independent nations, us, non-industrializing. You want to begin to feed yourself. You go to number eight, independent nations industrializing. You now, as an African-Asian country, find yourself in 1945 in a world environment where you're struggling to become from under colonialism, but the people who had you under colonialism still got gun to your head. They still control the oil and the wood and the food. So what you have to do is you have to ascribe and buy in to this IMF World Bank structure that they set up because you don't have weapon. And that's how we got locked into it. Now, when we later, if not this time, the next time, you will see how we're getting unlocked by virtue of the fact that America, at this point, control 50% of all manufactured goods and 50% of the world's economy came through America. So they could squeeze and embargo you. They had weapons so they can kill Lumumba, they can knock off the Shah, they could do it then. 
But now America controls less than 9% of the world's economy. So anybody they sanction has no meaning because they don't control it anymore. And not only that, you got other countries like China, India, Pakistan, and others who now have large armies but now have the bomb. Yes, sir. And we will get it from our Asian friends. So now things are evening up. And that's why Fidel Castro has never gone under an IMF structural program and he's still, they're still around for 37 years. So you don't have to ascribe them. So you say, well, how did Nigeria and how did these countries get locked into this IMF? Start in 1945 with the white European German having the control of the weapon and control of the natural resources. You had to do what, he, what they told you. But now the world being different, the bets are all off. So now let's go down to five. You now want to industrialize. We're Ghana. We want to become industrial, 1947. But if we need oil, who do we have to go to? A white man, because he controlled oil, right? Now we don't have to go to the white, but if you wanted oil, you had to go to European. They control it. You wanted copper. You wanted tin. You had to go to a European at that point. So everybody had to go to the IMF and World Bank, all Asians, all African, to get what they needed to make world trade because who controlled the world trade? At that point, Europeans. So you got stuck with the loan. You had to pay it back. And so what would happen is as you get the loan, of course the way they structure it, you never get to pay back. So what is it that you have to now send? We're Ghana. So we get some oil from America. We get some copper from America that they're stealing from another African country. And America says, OK, England, you owe us $2 billion. But what do you have to send in place of $2 billion? What do they want? Do they want paper? What do they want back? Number six. So what do the African and Asian countries get locked into? Sending back to pay back this little loan. So for me to get a few barrels of oil and some copper, the way the GAT, the Agreement of Tariff and Trade, got it locked up in here, I now got to give you half of my corn, half of my wheat, half of my gold, half of my timber. So that's how they get to get the raw materials back again. How they get the labor back again in the technology. So the Europeans had to devise a method where they can still get the labor, raw materials and technology, but not physically be there to conquer you, because they couldn't hold you. So they had the IMF scheme. So now if you want to do trade and get something, you got to come to a European. And he, they set the, the terms of the trade on what you must pay them back with. So the African Asian countries then turn around and number six have to pull back into what? United States and Europe, gold, rubber, tin, food. So now they're stronger and stronger. You're getting poorer and poorer, but you can't break the cycle because your mind isn't clear and your guns aren't clear and you don't control the raw materials yet. So now you're feeding, so we caught in the death cycle. That's why Africa, 90% of everything Africa makes, they have to send it to America and Europe. 90% of everything they generate. So you see why America and Europe stay rich and you stay poor. Now the United States has another scheme. They say, look, we don't want to put any industry in, in Africa. But what we'll do is, let's put some industry in South Korea. Let's choose a country that's friendly to us that we can control. Isn't it a coincidence that the United States didn't pour in any industrial development into North Korea? None into North Vietnam? None into China? None into any place they didn't control. So what did they do? They went to Thailand, Malaysia, Indonesia. These countries who were coming from under colonialism, like Nigeria and Ghana, weak and had to ascribe to this thing. Then you get a handful of people in, the, in those governments, we'll make you rich. You do this and we'll set you up in the hell with the rest of the people. So what do they do in number seven? They take in Korea. Say, Korea, we want to build you an automobile industry. Korea has nothing. But we'll take the copper from Zambia. We'll take the iron from Zimbabwe. We'll take the gold from here, and we'll take the oil from everything. So they take all these raw materials from their colonies, and they say to Korea, I'll ship you raw materials, food, and machinery to industrialize Korea. So the United States and the West industrialize Korea, using your natural resources, of course, and your technology. They industrialize Malaysia. They industrialize those Asian countries. But what did the Asian countries have to do? 
Then they say to the bankers, we'll give you loans and credit and currency. So now what you do is you set up South Korea, a little, a little image, mirror image of America, and you deal in currency and you deal in money and all these other things, okay. But now Korea has to ship back to America and the order IMF interest, money, or raw material. So now Ghana is caught in the cycle. It has to send back raw materials. Now, in the, uh, what's his name? Korea is caught in the cycle. None of you can get out of the cycle because you stuck. But then Castro came along and he functioned without the IMF and World Bank. Now, what happened to number seven? When number eight, the Korea is an independent industrializing nation, and number four, Ghana, which is an independent, but it's not industrializing yet. Both of them are sending back to United States and IMF and World Bank. What? Money, resources, wood to keep these countries rich and strong. And because they set the terms, you always fall behind. And what happens in number 10? You default. You default because it's structurally designed to default. Right. Yeah. When you default, you have to undergo an IMF bailout. And you have to, then you lose your independence. Mm -hmm. Now let's go to page two and see how the IMF work, how you lose your independence, and how you get it back. And number two, you'll see a series of articles, and they have the, uh, the, low, the where we took them from and the dates. And it says in the IMF, where does the money come from? Upper left-hand corner. 181 member nation IMF, they started as Germans. But later on, they let all countries become members because most of the countries are borrowing. Right. All of us got bank, bank accounts in Citibank or manufactured. You got a bank account, does it mean you have anything to do with the control? No. So out of 180 members of the IMF contribute to the pool of funds that agency has to lend. Most of the countries that join the IMF have no money to lend the IMF. Most of the countries that have money to lend the IMF are listed below. The IMF now has about $200 billion. This is as of 12, 1987. Excuse me, 12, 1987. It has about $200 billion coming mostly from the richest nation. You notice how they got rich. Who was the biggest contributor? U.S. government, Germany, Japan, Britain, France, and Saudi Arabia. These are the trilateral. Who are the trilateral? U.S., Canada, one side, Canada, uh, Japan, the other side, and Western Europe. So these are trilateral. This is their lending agency. Let's go to upper part number one. It says one under IMF. What is the IMF? The organization with all, with all this power was established in Bretton Wood Conference near the end of World War II. That's in New Hampshire, America. The goal was to build a new international economic order and thus avoid a repetition of the post-Cold War, etc. We're reading only the underlying words. It is headquarters in Washington, D.C., only a few blocks from the White House, which alone makes it suspect in the eyes of some countries its top executive included, includes a manufacturing de director, this man from France, and the first deputy manager director, this man from America. They report to 24-person international executive board. You can imagine who's on the board. We go up to the upper right-hand corner. The IMF staff members constantly roam the globe, visiting countries and meeting with financial ministers and central banks. It is very important that we put out, out fires with, without giving people an incentive to leave matches burning. The organization itself has operated with a high level of secrecy, if not mystery, that has inflamed critics. You don't know what's going on, what deals are made. The IMF officials in their public statements speak in a language that seems purposely oblique out of professional fear of rattling the financial community. Number three, down the right hand side. The IMF has tackled the problem of even bigger economies in the past. Back in 1963, 
A major industrial nation was scaring off foreign investors who were nervous about its worsening balance of payment and were losing confidence in its overall economic policies. The troubled country borrowed $250 million from the fund that year, another $3 million the next, and the rescue package worked. The currency stabilized and investors' confidence was restored. Which was, which, which, which was this stumbling country that needed the IMF, the United States? Number four, just list the countries that they made the major bailout to. If we go up to the middle of that page on the left, you see IMF to consider more capital. Where do they get the money from? Washington, December 15th. Seeking to ensure that it has sufficient financial reserve to cope with the crisis, this man requests more capital from the 181 member nations to replenish the fund reserve after the unexpected bailout Indonesia and South Korea. Appears unlikely, then they go, it says, it appears on the upper right hand corner, it appears unlikely to win financial support from the United States. Let's go to the third page. Okay, so to get an overview of what you're dealing with now, you're dealing in a world where you have a set of countries who racially are Germans. England, France, Spain, Portugal, Germany, Russia. Added on Japan and a little add on Canada. Struggling to maintain as much control of the world's economy as they could. Knowing that they started this process about 500 years ago, brought it to its peak about 19, the year 1900, <coughs> and now in 1945 are rapidly losing control over it. Who are struggling with their institution of the NATO, the UN, and the IMF and World Bank to keep you locked in. In this page, we're going to deal with how they work specifically. And after you look at here, you can apply it to any country in the IMF and World Bank, because this is exactly how they work. These, this chart was put together from information taken from different sources, financial and other ones, about Korea at the time they went down. Let's look at it, and it'll, we can cover it very shortly. Let's look at the upper left-hand corner. You notice there's an arrow that says bank deposits, pensions, insurance, stock markets, and taxpayers. The IMF gets almost all their money from the governments of the United States, England, France, Germany, and Japan. When the United States government makes a $20 billion contribution to the IMF, where did the money come from? Your tax revenues. When Citibank manufactures Hanover, when your New York City pension plan and your New York State pension plan, all those tens of billions of dollars, that's why you can't touch your money until you're 65, because they're playing with it. <laughs> All your pension money, these tens of billions of dollars are taken up by these financial <coughs> investors, Germans. And where do they put? IMF. Where do they go? They go to loan these companies, your pension money. That's where the power of the money is coming from, the little person. But you think, and I think all these great Millikan and all these Ruben, these guys are rich and stuff, they are using your pension money. That's where your money is coming from. So when you see up in there, Europe 35% of the, Japan 50%, the US 15%, this represents the rough percentage in which these countries invested into Korea. This is specific for Korea. But regardless of whether it's Korea, Malaysia, Indonesia, when you turn on the TV and you hear them in Congress fighting over whether or not to give 30 billion to the IMF, so that the IMF can take the 30 billion and lend it to somebody, it's your tax dollars. So therefore, they can't fix your roads, they close down the schools, et cetera, et cetera. You go to get your pension fund, and all of a sudden, you only can get 60 cents on a dollar. You can't touch your Social Security. That's why they want to take all your Social Security, put it in the stock market, so they can legally steal it. <laughs> These 
are the master thieves that you live with. This is them. I mean, this is their record. This is how they function. So you understand when we look and some of us say, look how powerful these people are. They take your money. Now they got your pension money. City Bank took your pension money and this Metropolitan Prudential, the other day was one of the Prudential was, they lost 10 billion. They couldn't find it. The government said pay back four. Okay, they now take your money and they now lend it primarily not to the government of South Korea, but to the private businesses in South Korea, to the private banks, to the private. So when you look at this upper strip, you notice that in the Korea it says government, private banks, and private companies, correct? Mm-hmm. Now, in that slit, you notice you see short-term interest? It's less than 30 days, and you notice long-term loan? Greater than 90. Now, if you look on